it's a great pleasure to have a chance briefly to talk to Stephen on this occasion. Uh, Stephen, um, just for the record, when and where were you born? Mm. I was born um, in Middlesex Hospital uh, in um, London, uh, which is uh, right uh, on the edges of Soho, just off Tottenham Court Road. So, and when? Uh, oh, back in 1961. That was 2nd of February 1961. Right. And um, let's, uh, I usually go through the whole schooling and so on, but I really want to uh, whisk on today to the time when you got involved in gardening, your mm. occupation. When was that? Well, it was, um, it was a road to Damascus experience, really, because uh, prior to um, being interested in landscapes and uh, horticulture and things like that, um, that you know, there, there, wasn't, there, wasn't a, there really wasn't a, uh, a family tradition in there other than my Shetland side of my family who, um, who crofted in the Shetland Islands. Mm. So it was um, uh, the the sort of the, the germ of the idea really came along in um, when I was 16, 15, 16. But I can trace it back along before then because I was always interested in landscapes. And as a as a little boy, I was always out running out into the wilds and uh, having to be called back eventually at the end of the day, covered in mud, exhausted, <laughs> uh, usually clutching a newt or something. <laughs> Where was this? This wasn't Middlesex. Uh, no, no, that well, well no. We uh, my my parents uh, lived in um, East Finchley, mm. uh, North London, um, and uh, my father. Uh, when I when I came along, my father was still in the RAF. Um, he'd been conscripted. He was one of the last um, last uh, national service people. He just uh, come back from the sea, where he was an officer in the merchant navy. But his eyesight has failed him. Uh, to come home, up to his chagrin, ended up um, uh, in the uh, RAF, um, and so we were living in North London. Mm. But North London in the early 1960s, 1961, was a ghastly place, uh, as you can imagine, because of the smogs, or the, the huge pea supers, and uh, I wasn't particularly good on the asthma side. So um, we moved out. We moved out first to Hemel Hempstead, Newtown, uh, and then from Hemel Hempstead we moved out to Stevenage. But we were always, uh, the, you know, part of uh, my fascination about the landscape is sort of from a socialist point of view. And of course, in 1947, we had the Newtown Acts, which was a spectacular piece of uh, uh, social legislation, the like of which hasn't been seen since. And so basically, we were moving into sort of greenfield sites, right on the edge of the countryside. And uh, it was in Stevenage. Um, everybody sees Stevenage as being the, the center of Stevenage and then the, uh, um, the housing estates off. But when you get to the edge, there's this fantastic countryside, and I used to sort of haunt the countryside from from an early age there. But um, Frederick Gibbard, Sir Frederick Gibbard, um, who uh, was the master planner for uh, Harlow, uh, really brought a, a huge amount of the countryside into what he did. And Harlow has these wonderful corridors of landscape going into the centre of it, which is sadly now being built all over. But it's people like Gibbard that inspired. Uh, the new towns that inspired a generation of youngsters like me. And then, having rushed around the countryside at the age of fifteen or sixteen, what what happened then? Um, well, I'd been doing sort of casual gardening jobs and just enjoying it, and just enjoying mm. feeling the soil between my fingers and being outside. And um, uh, started sixth form and then there's this sort of creeping realization that uh, you know once sixth form or college or whatever I wanted to do I'd actually have to do have to make a living and uh, a lot of my friends in sixth form were sort of already pointing in a career direction but uh, I didn't have any particular one but I did know that I didn't want to be bound within a building and that I wanted something creative and I wanted something that uh, not only could you do physically but you could also take it beyond that uh, and that's where horticulture appealed and um, uh, I was lined up to go to Hull University to take a degree in uh, botany and geography which had been really good fun because I was a bit wild in the sixth form <laughs> they still 
uh, offered me a place at the university. It was lovely. And Hull is, uh, uh, you know, a lot of people deride Hull, but I, a huge wellspring of creativity that's mm. come out of there. Um, but uh, then um, I turned around and said, no, we're not going to university. And my parents said, you know, because I, I'd been the first from our family, on my side of the family, to do this because um, the, the, the fields of academe weren't sort of toiled over much yeah. on my side of the family. <laughs> and uh, they said, are you sure you don't want to go? Because 11% of, only 11% of the school population went to uni at that time. But I was absolutely set on it, and I went and uh, worked on a nursery, and worked landscaping and doing forestry work for a year with the Peterborough Development Corporation, and then went to Agricultural College after the, that to do one of those newfangled HNDs at the time. Mm. But yeah, where was the Agricultural College? Now that was at Rittle, which is uh, a village outside Chelmsford. Mm. Um, you know. Um, after the war, when food production and the the U-boats in the Atlantic became such an important thing, and how you know we're very nearly starved to death as a country, um, the res government response was to try and up the ante within agriculture, and this resulted in a, a, a swarm of agricultural colleges across the country, um, and they were wonderful things. Um, um, and I, I came to work in one later on, but uh, Rittle is one of the larger ones and it actually uh, offered higher education as well as further education and it was higher education that I was particularly interested in um, and um, it's still going strong um, despite the fact that uh, most agricultural colleges have been subsumed into other general purpose FE, HE colleges or have ceased to be altogether, you know that the time where agriculture and food production was seen very much on an individualistic basis has just mm. moved away, which is terribly sad. Were there any teachers at Rittle who <laughs> yeah. particularly inspired you or who kept in touch with? Yeah, there are some wonderful ones and there are also some poorly ones. <laughs> <laughs> you might want to edit that one out. <laughs> um, the, uh, I think, I think uh, my mentor was a chap called Tony Clark. Mm. Uh, it was a wonderful man, very kind, lots of experience, mm. um, a, a natural teacher, and, and also wonderfully eccentric. Mm. Uh, his manner of speaking was uh, quite distinct. <laughs> and uh, if uh, people uh, who've actually been taught by him gather together, you can always guarantee Tony Clark impressions breaking out after about five <laughs> minutes into the, into the, into the meeting. But um, he was an old school horticulturalist uh, and landscaper and um, his idea is, you know, basically very fundamental to, to what the craft is and off the back of his sort of uh, knowledge there were a, a range of other tutors there who were more clued in on the sort of technology side. And well, can you explain what the craft is, briefly? What is the craft? Mm. That is, um, it's an awareness. Um, and it's an awareness that's born of learning and experience. Uh, my, my father had a wonderful quote which he used often when I was growing up and falling over, which was, you know, um, experience is something you get just after you really needed it. <laughs> <laughs> and um, experience is something you get as you, as you develop your way through horticulture. It's, we're rare and fabulous beasts now, Alan, because um, in, in times gone by, local authorities would train a huge raft of youngsters coming through via the City and Guilds Day Release Schemes, uh, it, which in conjunction with National Diplomas and Higher National Diplomas actually produced a, a, a wonderful group of uh, individuals fascinated by gardening and horticulture. Uh, but when you get to my age, you sort of develop this sixth sense about what's right and what's wrong, uh, which is you reference against all of the experiences which you've had in the past. And um, it's a little bit like bird watchers. Sometimes a bird watcher will see um, a tiny little brown bird, they're called LBJs, little brown jobs, <laughs> like that. And you say, what was that? And they'll tell you. And then you say, well, how do you know it was that? And they say, well, it's because it's what it is. <laughs> <laughs> and, and that is what being a, a seasoned horticulturist is. How is that taught? Um, it's taught 
but it's developed it's a, an innate thing uh, it, and a lot of it comes from inside um, you can only teach the subject so far um, it's the development of things like your plant knowledge and your plant awareness and referencing back to where uh, you saw plants and you saw them how they're growing together it's all about associations the way that everything associates with each other and how you want those associations to work in a way that is pleasing for you but also for the people employing you so it's like any craft it's like um, yes. pottery or painting you have to learn it by doing it and then being told what's wrong with what you're doing exactly right yeah there is there there isn't uh, anybody in horticulture who hasn't fallen flat on their face mm. and you generally find that the horticulturists who have fallen flat on their face more often are the better for it uh, <laughs> which is which is good but um it, it, it is the experience thing and it's that reference i mean i think most horticulturists who are very good at plants and plant knowledge because plant knowledge is a fundamental of what we do i have semi-eidetic memories mm. in other words they can retrieve where they saw plants firstly uh, via their via visual memory which is quite which is quite fascinating mm. for example um i can remember um my first plant i did at Riddle college which was back in 1980 i can remember the detail of the shrubs and the plants that, that i actually i can even remember handling them and uh, it's a it's a fascinating mm fascinating thing to have and the more you work with plants the more this skill develops mm. very interesting so after Rittal uh, what did you do then? Mm. well that was interesting um, Rittal was fascinating because there was also work experience and I spent a year working with Norwich City Council uh, which is a lovely left wing council at the time lots and lots of social housing a fantastic gardens team uh, I worked out of the offices I was the supernumerary <laughs> uh, so but basically they realized that I could do more than just uh, um, fill a desk space and I, I got to do all sorts um, and uh, that really I work and interested in landscape and garden history so um, when I finished at Rittle um, I then um, worked for a while as a, a casual warden at a country park in the Neen Valley a park in Peterborough and then went to work at Cambridge University Botanic Gardens uh, which was fascinating this is back in 1983 and the first two weeks were staying with Max Walters and of yes. course yes I knew him yes a lovely man he was at King's course. yes he was yeah. and then he was the director at the, and uh, he was an absolute gentleman and uh, his wife uh, was a graduate of Nottingham uh, Uni as well in horticulture so they were fearsome uh, um, fearsomely clever um, I could fill a book about uh, stories about Cambridge Botanics <laughs> but sadly I was only there for a little while sadly and happily when uh, my tutor um, Tony Clark who I told you about rang me up and he had a consultancy at Braxton Park in North Essex which is a fascinating estate great big historic estate first mentioned in uh, the patent rolls of Edward the I don't know Edward the third can't remember um, uh, when it was a deer park and then um, became the seat of Peter Duquesne I though he wasn't of course the first at that time uh, who was um, a uh, of, of Protestant, Protestant stock who escaped from the persecutions of D'Alva mm -hmm. um, on the continent um, and uh, did the opposite thing he wasn't landed gentry who, who, who moved into the city he actually did very well in the city he became a uh, um, became chair of uh, the Bank of England and then moved out into the countryside and bought an estate and uh, Tony asked would I like to be the head gardener there and um, and I said well that would be an amazing challenge considering the fact that I was only 22 <laughs> uh, and it was a remarkable uh, opportunity and despite the fact that I didn't want to leave Cambridge I had to mm. and that's where I went so 1983 I found I, I pitched up with my own little cottage outside the gatehouses of a spectacular historic landscape uh, the majority of which uh, the majority of the extant features went back to about um, uh, about uh, back end of the 17th uh, back end of the 17th century front end of the 18th century 
uh, sorry, uh, 18th century, front end of the 19th century. And it was remarkable. And I spent five years there and Tony was absolutely lovely. And uh, I would, um, t- um, Tony's uh, um, children were sort of round about my age. So, um, so I had formed a circle of friends in the little villages out near the Blackwater Estuary. What is the village? Um, well, the village at um, Braxted was a great Braxted itself, oh, but, right. but, um, but an, an awful lot of uh, um, sort of social life and a lot of lovely people lived out by the coast at the village of Goldhanger, mm. uh, which is just opposite uh, um, uh, O.C. Island. Yes. And um, you know, at the end of the day, um, it would, if the tide was up, you'd sort of just drive down, uh, run out to the sea wall and then go swimming. <laughs> which is which is lovely. <laughs> what was your main job? Yeah. Well, I was the I was the head gardener, but uh, Tony preferred to call me the gardens manager because it gave me more <laughs> gravitas, apparently. <laughs> but which is funny. But um, Tony, as a consultant, produced a, a management plan that I worked to and then developed. Um, but uh, so my job was everything really. I had a very small workforce which I developed. But it was a, a garden which had sort of fallen into decay over many, many years. It had a little bit of a resurgence in the 1960s. And my job was to just basically restore it as best we could with the resources that we had and uh, try and do things that would see the landscape and the garden uh, fit for purpose in the future. You know, this included planting loads and loads of cedar of Lebanon, which now will be substantial trees. Mm. and. Uh, Restoring a, a wonderful five-acre uh, woodland garden, uh, there were wonderful pleasure grounds around it that, that dated from sort of the 1780s, um, um, 1800s, and uh, there was also a, a rich vein of uh, documentary evidence because in 1985 English Heritage were starting to list work were, were in the process of listing all historic landscapes and gardens and listing them, mm-hmm. grade one, grade two, grade two star. Um, the Gardens History Society, who I joined, um, had um, done a cursory visit to Braxton and completely missed the point. So I uh, spent quite a lot of time um, corresponding with Dr. Christopher Thacker, who was the Gardens History um, Advisor to the to English Heritage at the time, and actually got the garden properly registered as a Grade One listed historic landscape, mm. which was a um, which is a real triumph. Mm. Um, uh, yeah, so it was basically doing everything from sitting on a mower to edging to uh, propagating plants to planting right the way through to the strategic stuff. Wonderful, wonderful mm. experience. It was indeed. And uh, then where, where did you go after that? Well, um, the agent of the estate was a chap called Peter Innes, who was a lovely man. Uh, and he'd been a lecturer at Y College, which was one of the foremost land-based universities in the country until Imperial College um, did what it did to it many years later. And uh, uh, Peter was also a, a chair of uh, Rittle College, the chairman of the, of the governors of Rittle College. And um, he felt that I needed challenges new as a, because you know there's only so much you could do and wrote a lovely uh, reference for me for a, a lecturing position, junior lecturing job at uh, Otley College, which was Suffolk's uh, land-based college um, and uh, I went along for interview and got the job. And my job was a junior lecturer was teaching um, uh, horticulture, amenity and decorative horticulture, uh, some commercial horticulture, and also uh, working with the students that were on uh, conservation programs, practical conservation programs. Because uh, this was the uh, by this time it's 1987, so we were we were in in the period of. Um, depression and mm. uh, of, uh, yeah, Thatcher, <laughs> and uh, uh, of course we had the community program going and offering people jobs because mm. there's so many people out of work at the time it was terrible. And um, uh, Otley did an awful lot of work with these uh, folk, and they were wonderful people. They had l- life experiences doing other other work, and there they were working for Suffolk Wildlife Trust on community program gangs going out involved in conservation work. And um, also, just um, after I've been there a little while, I, I managed courses as well, and then also started to write courses. 
um, because at that point in time there was proper money available for mature students who wanted to retrain and further education was supported more pro uh, let's get my language right uh, it was was um, supported appropriately whereas these days further education has just been kicked off a cliff by successive governments and mm. is languishing mm. and you enjoyed the teaching it was a real challenge uh, uh, Otley at that time was a bare ass little place <laughs> uh, and uh, you know it was on a perched on a hill surrounded by really heavy clay soil um, the, the, the buildings we'd outgrown the buildings so an awful lot of the teaching happened in porter cabins <laughs> and we worked and we grew the college with us so it was a delightful organic process mm. um, that uh, that went on from 1987 to the year 2000 when unfortunately the cold winds of economic change came along. You stayed there till 2000? I stayed there until 2011. Did you? Yeah. Gosh. I, I was, uh, but every year it was a different role. Um, I, I um, became the head of horticulture in charge of a whole department, um, mm. which was a substantial department in those days, um, in uh, 1996. Uh, no, 1995. Um, and um, as a head of department, it was really a case of then you found yourself more involved in the strategic activity of what went on. Um, and that was still a period of, of building, but as we sort of headed towards the year 2000, then uh, we had a change of uh, principle and uh, what, what was very orientated towards the community changed direction very suddenly and became quite an aggressive environment to be in. And, um, it was a, a challenge. There were some good years after the year 2000. There's a number of good years, but there was also, like so many other colleges at that time, huge challenges, restructures, and um, the, the sort of the, the dreadful thing of having to reapply for your job on a regular basis that uh, we weren't alone at happening, happening mm. to. Um, but it was worth sticking with um, because there was still a lot more good than bad. Mm -hmm. uh, until 2011 when I thought my stint in education was done now. It was time to walk the talk a bit. This is a, almost a quarter of a century you're there. Mm. There must have been quite a lot of change in the philosophy of horticulture yeah. in a quarter of a century. I mean, Massive, yeah. What, were, what was one or two of the main... Well, it's, uh, it's, it's quite interesting. Um, I, whilst at um, Otley I did um, I did my course, I did my Certificate of Education, my Cert Ed. Um, I was also um, working my way through uh, a Masters uh, um, via Essex University, but delivered at Rittle College because mm -hmm. Essex were working with Rittle at the time. And um, that all came to a grinding halt in 2000 when the first restructures happened and I had to give up my studies in order to protect staff and also protect myself. So. I uh, came out with a post-grad certificate um, when I'd really quite like to have gone on further and eventually got a doctorate. Um, so the changes to horticulture, many, many fold. Um, horticulture, amenity and decorative horticulture we're talking about here. This is the, the maintenance and management of private uh, open spaces and landscapes and gardens, historic landscapes and gardens. It also involves all of the public realm. Um, an awful lot of um, the work that uh, traditional horticulturists engage in was within the public realm. And we saw, uh, during my time there, we, we saw uh, uh, the, the people who work in local authorities, who work in public open spaces, love the gardens, love the landscapes. It's not just something they do, it's something that they are. And of course that was torn to pieces with uh, compulsory competitive tendering. Um, um, CCT, uh, which uh, which came uh, along with Thatcher, and um, uh, an awful lot of the public realm, just basically in terms of the way that we manage it, and in terms of the way that the training, uh, just basically faltered and died because local authorities couldn't afford to run training programs anymore, which basically massively de-skilled the sector that I'm in, and we saw a fall off of students. And, uh, and um, this is a great shame because there's a, a need for what we do. It's one of the, the, the um, civilising 
elements of society is to maintain the public realm in a way that's fitting for the people who are mm. the public realm. Has there been any uh, improvement? No, it's just Got getting worse, worse and worse and worse. And the austerity of the last few Conservative um, governments and uh, and uh, the, the disastrous coalition just didn't help. Mm. There was a resurgence when Labour were in, but Labour didn't understand. You know, they, they didn't understand further education. Um, they just kept tinkering with it and messing it about. And they didn't, didn't, certainly didn't understand the importance of what they had surrounding mm. them. And uh, the current, the, the situation at the moment is that local authorities have statutory responsibilities and fiduciary responsibilities. Mm. As you know, you don't have to carry out those fiduciary responsibilities. So they go by the wayside, mm. and that's basically what is happening. And with austerity, with, with what's gone what on... What is a fiduciary um, responsibility? Something would be nice for you to do, <laughs> but you don't have to do it. <laughs> so uh, parks and open spaces are a fiduciary. Mm. And the problem there is that um, now funding is being withdrawn from local authorities hand over fist and they're now thinking about handing over parks to parks trusts which are basically run by the people the mm -hmm. folk you know well, I think that's fine but they will need guidance and they're not going to get that guidance mm -hmm. Tom Lehrer mm -hmm. uh, my favourite uh, songwriter and performer once said that the problem with folk music was that it was written by the folk. <laughs> <laughs> and the same can be said for what's going to happen to Parks. Mm. Okay, on that uh, grim um, note, we'll leave that phase. Mm. And, and was it from there that you came to King's? Or there was a gap, something in between? Yes, um, I, I, I decided, I, I say grim, there is always hope. Um, you know, it's we, we say that there are issues here, but the, the, the key thing is that we still have those open spaces. They haven't been built all over. We still have a, a planning structure that prevents that happening, and who knows what will happen in the future. Mm. So although things aren't the way they should be, you know, we, you never give up. Yeah. You, you always, you're always waiting for the sun to peep through the clouds. <laughs> but, um, yeah, what, what happened after that was that in 2011 I decided that, um, that uh, education, I needed a break from that lot and possibly... Um, never to return to lecturing ever again, uh, and I wasn't disappointed when I made that. This, that, that when I, I think every lecturer knows it's time to stop, mm. uh, and that was my time. Uh, the, the folk who don't stop when it is time for them to stop, I think that's part of their tragedy, and I've seen some of that, which is sad. But um, I decided it was time to go back and walk the talk. So um, I uh, got a job um, uh, with a landscape architect's practice and worked um, uh, doing um, historic landscape um, uh, surveys, statements of significance, and also uh, arboricultural consultancy, which was jolly good fun. Mm. And that went on for the best part of the year. Uh, then I moved over and uh, got some more practical experience working for a a friend's landscape construction company, which was really good fun. And it was excellent because you have a whole suite of skills and you're just practicing your your your, your practical skills. And because I'm old and gnarly and I've got some of the tickets, you know, I could go out driving the seven and a half ton lorry. And uh, it's, you know, just, just, it was fun. And it was very um, comforting. And uh, then from there, I was uh, um, offered, uh, one of my old students actually rang me up and said, would you like uh, to interview for a job restoring Glenham Hall Gardens, mm. the landscapes of Glenham Hall, which is in Suffolk. Yeah. So I went along and uh, got the job, um, you know, and it was a remarkable, Glenham Hall is a remarkable place. Yeah, I know it is. It is absolutely remarkable. Mm. And uh, I had... Um, I had four fantastic years there, um, putting back together uh, a landscape and a garden that had been neglected because the previous owners, other than Lady Blanche Cobbold, who of course was uh, was daughter of the Tolly Cobbold, <laughs> yes, indeed, yeah, well, and well, Lady Blanche was uh, of the Cavendish family. Mm. Um, uh, uh, her famous quote when she was patron of Ipswich Town Football Club was when asked whether um, she'd like to be introduced to the new. Uh, um, 
uh, leader of the opposition, a certain Margaret Thatcher, uh, at Arsenal in an away match, turned around and said, actually, I prefer another gin and tonic. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, yeah, no, so that was uh, Glenham Hall. Um, and um, that was a wonderful community again, a wonderful community of people we've met. Mm. And there was lots of playing of music and lots of... Uh, meeting of um, artists and artisans who, who worked on the estate. Mm. And um, then, <clears throat> then, very sadly, uh, uh, my wonderful boss, Raven Hope Cobbold, mm. who was uh, a Kiwi by um, origin, wonderful, wonderful woman, um, fell ill and encouraged me to, uh, to get work elsewhere because she didn't quite know where the succession was going. Bless her. Um, the, guard, the, the place is actually now in, in Tom Cobbold's hands, Tom Hope Cobbold, and, and um, we're all really sort of uh, hoping that Tom's going to make a really good job of it. He's a nice chap. Um, and, um, and that's when King's College came along. How did that happen? I mean, were you approached or did you hear about it? Or? Um, I heard about it. Um, <clears throat> I applied for the job and uh, was offered it um, later the same day as the interview happened, mm. which was uh, quite lovely. Was it Mike Proctor interviewed you? Or? It was uh, the Dome Spurser, so, uh, so uh, Phil, uh, Phil yeah. interviewed me, uh, with uh, Steve Elstub, uh, uh, the head gardener at Clare College, riding mm. shotgun, which was really nice. <laughs> uh, yeah. Great, well congratulations. Um, tell me briefly about the King's Garden and its history. It's fascinating. <coughs> um, I spent time in the archives with Patricia and Peter and they're wonderful people. Um, I'm so impressed with the breadth and depth of their knowledge. Um, the garden, we know that the, the college itself, 1441, um, the negotiations that Henry VI's administration had with the, the, the Cambridge authorities at the time to clear what was essentially the centre of Cambridge must have been remarkable, <laughs> uh, considering what went. Um, uh, you know, parish churches, uh, uh, the sort of precursor to Christ College, uh, Carmelite nunnery, uh, several inns, uh, several boarding houses for um, roistering students, uh, and um, and a key. You know, that's all. On, yeah, it's remarkable. Um, so um, you have basically, like any historic landscape, this this wonderful development one layer on another layer on another layer on another layer with all those wonderful stories that are associated with each of the layer as well as the physical artifacts because landscape and garden history isn't just about the artifacts there or the artifacts that are under the ground it's about the people it's about the fashions it's about the time it's about the politics it's about everything which is why why it's fascinating so when you see a landscape and garden uh, a landscape and got a, a, a historic landscape such as King's, it's just the most remarkable place. And how would you not want to work there? <laughs> mm. And the actual Fellows Garden, which is only a small part of it, of course, is yeah. quite late, isn't it? It is, yes. And there's, there's lots of research to do there as well. Um, the Fellows Garden itself uh, came along, I haven't got the dates in front of me, uh, um, uh, Dr. Walters wrote a very good little handbook on it which hasn't been surpassed yet but I'm going to have a go at it later <laughs> on, bless me. But um, yeah, it came along around about 1850, 1840, 1850. Uh, um, uh, prior to then it had been secured by the college uh, as a paddock for the uh, provost's horses, mm -hmm. coach horses. Uh, and then the fellows were allowed to walk around a sort of a fairly rudimentary path around it with the horses still there. But it's very difficult to maintain your dignity as a fellow when you're pursued by hungry <laughs> coach horses. <laughs> so eventually, uh, I think it was Provost Oaks at the time, relented and, and put the horses somewhere else. And that's when it uh, started to emerge as a garden. And um, a... Uh, local landscape construction company um, managed by a chap called Robert Fuller I think um, were retained to actually uh, do the work in the garden there isn't a design there isn't a there isn't a um, uh, any sort of uh, plans associated with it that we know of in our archives but we do have the planting lists 
and the nursery lists, uh, which are fascinating. Um, and, but essentially what the Fellows Garden was originally designed was, was a sort of Victoria Pleasure Garden, Victorian Pleasure Garden, mm. uh, not formal, informal, but you see you had that sort of informality within Victorian gardens as well as the, the sort of the starkly formal side of the Italian, of, of, sorry, of Victorian gardens. Because mm. Victorian garden design was as eclectic as everything else. Mm. And you could go from one end, which would be archly formal, right the way to the other end as, you know, rustic with a K on the end <laughs> <laughs> and everything in between. Uh, so, you know, if you wanted a, a, a near comparison with what we have with the Fellows Garden there, you'd actually have to look at the work of um, uh, John Claudius Loudon, who was a fascinating chap, um, who was a journalist, uh, a pro- uh, absolutely massively productive journalist. Um, uh, and his wife doesn't get enough recognition for everything that she did. She was a remarkable woman. Um, and uh, he wrote and wrote and wrote, uh, but also designed as well, did some design and took an awful lot of his inspiration from the later works of Humphrey Repton. Mm. Uh, and because towards the time of you know, Humphrey Repton's passing, he was really quite garden-esque. Mm. You know, he, he died in 1818. Mm. And by that time, his client base had basically died out. And the dear old boys complained that he had barely enough money to, to buy powder for his wig. <laughs> so, so um, is it a, 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 an unusual and uh, mm. important Victorian garden? Yes, it is. It's unusual because, um, yeah, yeah uh, uh, Loudon's Garden uh, in York, um, nearby the King's Manor, I can't remember the name. It was written for a worshipful company. It was it was designed for some sort of a worshipful company. Um, they are they are unusual because usually they get sort of mangled, mm-hmm. um, destroyed, built all over, uh, and, and the original purpose of that landscape or garden vanishes. Uh, at Kings, we still have the layout. We still have the formal structures that we actually look after, uh, and um, and there's a lot we can do to actually bring it back. Mm. to give it that, that more of that sort of Victorian twang, which is, mm. which is what we're working on. Do you um, feel that the pergola has uh, intervened in that? Or? Um, well, we, we're very lucky to have um, uh, Hugh Johnson on board. Uh, and Hugh Johnson is uh, a very talented horticulturalist raconteur and of course his his, uh, his wine expertise is second to none uh, and uh, Hugh is a, a fellow commoner on the gardens committee mm-hmm. um, now that the pergola is actually settling into the garden because uh, Hugh very kindly provided the money and the inspiration for that now that the pergola is settling into the garden it's actually fulfilling a role that uh, a central border you know, was there Mm. Um, prior to it appearing and now that it's starting to soften and now that the planting is really emerging as indeed you wished it to do um, I think the the pergola uh, certainly adds to the landscape. Mm. The other bit of the garden which I know a little bit about is the backs Mm. and it's reputed that that was laid out planned by Capability Brown, is that right? Ah now yes this is an interesting one not no, uh, but no, but yes, if I can say that, <laughs> because uh, Capability Brown worked for St John's, mm. and he produced the uh, wilderness garden uh, initially. Because uh, Capability Brown, we've just celebrated his tercentenary, mm. and of course he lived just down the road near Huntington. Um, uh, Brown, getting ever so excited about the work he did for St John's, then decided it'd be a great idea if he actually produced an English landscape garden, English landscape style garden style landscape, or landskip as they call them, all the way along the backs, um, but completely ignoring the boundaries between various colleges mm. which blurred and vanished, <laughs> using uh, the um, Gibbs building at King's as his country house. Mm. And you can imagine how that went down. <laughs> So essentially, all of the uh, the Riverside colleges affected got together. Uh, very polite, said so thank you ever so much, uh, uh, Mr. Brown. Um, have this lovely silver plate in, in recognition for your wonderful work, and nothing was ever done. <laughs> and the plan is still in in the library. Um, 
can think of reviewed. So it was planned by individual colleges, really. It was. It was. Uh, Capability Brown just basically did it off his own back, saying, "This wouldn't this be a wonderful thing, everybody? Here it is." And all the river psychologists said, "That's a lovely idea, but it doesn't actually show where the boundaries are. Mm. We're going to be fighting forever amongst each other, so no, thank you and goodbye." You know, <laughs> I know, I know. Trinity College still has a cannon pointing in the general direction of St John's. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think they want to take their fences down. Okay, uh, lovely story. Yeah. So let's now move on to. Um, an email which I got from you mm-hmm. about two years ago mm-hmm. um, saying that you had heard I had an interest in the stone on mm. the backs yes. um, associated with Zhu Zhu Mol, the yeah. famous Chinese poet. Mm. Wouldn't it be a nice idea to make a, a Chinese garden round this? And I wrote back saying, wonderful idea, but there is no chance you will get it through the garden committee. Can you take the story from there? <laughs> How you had the idea yes. to do that? Well, King's is a fascinating landscape. Um, it's, and it's a, it's a series of sort, of sort of landscape vignettes as you, as you move through from, from the front court all the way through to back to the fellow's garden and then beyond. Um, and uh, there are various elements of that landscape and those gardens sort of represent various times of the sort of the history of, of the college. What we haven't got within the college is, is anything which is um, contemporary with the times that we are in now. And I felt that what the landscape and gardens of Kings needed was something that actually reflected what happened in the 20th century, what's happening as we move through into the 21st century. Um, also, um, there are discrete areas within the college grounds where you could sort of conduct a, a, a landscape treatment, of the development of a garden, without impinging on the austere nature of the overall um, uh, college uh, grounds, which is very important that we don't impinge upon those. Um, and the, the germ of an idea came from there because um, Zhujimo, a very famous poet, I mean, he revered by millions and millions of, uh, of um, his fellow countrymen and women. And they want to pay homage to him when they come to this country. The stone is wonderful. I think the stone is absolutely lovely. It's a, it's a fantastic, lasting, uh, um, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a legacy. Mm. Um, but it would be really lovely, I felt, that associated with the stone, we, we produce a landscape that would uh, give visitors an opportunity to reflect, um, you know, quiet reflection <coughs> is, reflective practice is a very important thing. And there really wasn't much chance to do that because you were actually on the footpath, people are passing you mm. all the time. And it would also give recognition through something within the landscape of a, a particularly important time with the college um, and, and because it could be done in a, in a subtle and discreet manner that was the impetus I thought that would allow me to negotiate with the gardens committee to see if if this would be possible and um, after a period of, sort of intense negotiation and uh, a, a lot of um, diplomacy uh, the, the merits of this scheme was seen to outweigh the demerits and it was given the go ahead. But it, it's taken a, a lot of time. It's taken a, <coughs> not persuasion, but persuasion is the wrong word. It's just um, what, what I have needed to do is just, just to demonstrate with your help and, and with the Rivers Project help that this would enhance uh, a landscape and actually be a, a historic note, if you like, about um, a part of the college's history and where we are. It's well, been you're, exciting. You're obviously, it is very exciting, and you're obviously helped a lot by the fact that the provost is a very nice man, very sympathetic and supportive, yeah. Michael Proctor. Oh, he's absolutely superb. He is, um, he would have made an absolutely ideal um, sort of uh, 18th century patron to any, <laughs> any of the uh, any of you know he is a sort of a 21st century Lord Burlington really <laughs> uh, I hope that doesn't make me William Kent <laughs> but uh, he has a lot of uh, awareness uh, and um, I have a huge amount of respect for him. Tell me what roughly the, the 
plan is for that garden? What what sort of because you've got this difficult problem of fusing the east and the west, which is what Jules was trying to do. Yeah. How are you going to attempt to do that? Yes, it's um, the the sort of the Taoist symbol that we're using uh, has as a hard side and, and a soft side to it, and um, uh, or it has two sides to it. And Shijimo had had a, uh, a foot in both, um, you know, the the European um, society and also um, his home society um, that he revered, and he revered both. And it's pretty obvious. Um, by dividing the garden into two, using that that symbol. Now this the symbol, yin and yang. Yin and yang. Yeah. Mm. Now it's you know it, there there is a sort of a more you know it is a sort of seen as a more traditional um, um, uh, it's, uh, it's it's a sort of, it 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 doesn't necessarily reflect the reforming zeal that Jujimo had, but at the same point in time, it also demonstrates I feel through that sort of the division in the two halves, the fact that um, there were two two halves of the man, but at the same point in time, it's within a symbol that uh, that has its own resonance, very much so. And uh, by by sort of uh, acknowledging uh, Jujimo in this way, we were hoping that we would sort of uh, demonstrate his love of uh, his home culture and also his adopted culture. And what sort of plants will you be putting in there? Well, the great thing is that um, his uh, the city and, and province that he came from, an awful lot of the plants that are native there will grow perfectly happy in our climate. And you know, an, an awful lot of our ornamental planting in this country um, has its origins in China, which is the most remarkable, has the most remarkable flora. And um, so we will be planting a range of plants that, are, that represent the plants that he would have found. Is this is Haining. Yes, yes. Haining. Yeah, yeah. Mm. absolutely. That he would have found at home, um, um, but at the same point in time, are perfectly happy over here and are regularly grown over here. Mm. So, and we're starting to collect the plants. So tomorrow, um, uh, my uh, propagator Kevin is going out to. Uh, to start collecting uh, um, plants that are appropriate, and uh, um, which will be uh, exciting, gathering them all together. So there'll be a, a, a fair proportion of plants that uh, that um, that Jujimo would recognise instantly. But as we sort of move away from the, the from the Chinese element of the garden, as we move out. The, 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 the garden itself will bleed out into the landscape using native trees and shrubs from uh, this country mm. so that you will approach um, through Europe into China and then go from China back into Europe so Lovely. yeah and down the center of the yin yang there will be a path yes what what will be on that path well that's that's uh, we've been working on this one and that's been that's been a um, topic for great debate um, basically we are going to have in stone tablets uh, carved um, the first and last verses of uh, his famous famous poem on saying goodbye to Cambridge yes uh, and um, but also between them that they'll be they'll be sort of uh, letter carved in, in, in English we will have um, um, Mandarin calligraphy Mm. Um, uh, which will be um, uh, converted into a, a, um, a computer file um, software, uh, then um, laser cut, um, uh, and then actually set uh, the, the stone tablet with the verse. The, the lines on the verse will be set with the with the calligraphy one after the other as we're moving down. We still have to do some negotiation as to how they, the, how the, the the calligraphy will will read compared to the to the sort of English one, but I'm sure we can sort those out. <laughs> so basically, the centre path between the two uh, elements um, will take you on a journey through the poem, uh, both in um, Mandarin and also in English. Uh, which is very very exciting and then the path terminates in a bespoke seat uh, mm. in the shape of crescent moon which uh, was his symbol for his symbol. crescent moon society yes, yeah. mm. 
Um, uh, so basically, it'll give visitors not only the opportunity to reflect, but also to read, mm -hmm. uh, which I think would be special. And it'll be possible to see the river, because water is very important in Jujima. So you'll be able to see through to the canyon yeah. a bit. Yes, um, there's uh, the the drainage ditch that runs alongside the cam. And then there's a spit of land that, that uh, separates the cam from the drainage ditch that's mm. um, zoned by Queens. Um, uh, we'll be asking their head gardener very nicely if we can just trim up the, the willow which is on their side so that we can get views in. The, the elms that run along our side of the drainage ditch have just been um, done away with by Dutch elm disease so they'd need to be cut down anyway. Mm. Um, so that will allow uh, views of the garden and hopefully uh, sort of a, a slight glimpse of the stone uh, as, as people are punting along the cam, which would be lovely. Might even try a trompe d'oeil through to, yeah. because his room was in that quadrangle. Yeah. And you could see it if there were yeah. trees between. Yeah. It'd be nice to be able to just buy Yes. The room he spent a term in, uh, his last term. Well, all things are possible. <laughs> <laughs> I do like that idea. We'll develop right. that one further. Well, it's been a delight to talk to you, Stephen. Thank you very much indeed. Well, thank you very much indeed, Dylan.